The information shared on the Sky Women's Health podcast is for educational and informational purposes only and is not a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding your medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you heard on this podcast. Reliance on any information provided by Sky Women's Health, Dr. Carolyn Moyers, or any guests featured on the podcast is solely at your own risk. You're listening to Sky Women's Health Podcast, your evidence-based resource for women's health and wellness, exploring the holistic principles of osteopathy, integrating mind, body, and spirit, designed to empower you as your own healthcare advocate and help you live your best life. I'm your host, board-certified OBGYN, Dr. Carolyn Moyers. Welcome back to Sky Women's Health podcast where we empower women through knowledge and care that's personalized, evidence-based, and compassionate. I'm Dr. Carolyn Moyers, sports certified OBGYN, menopause certified physician, and Ishwish Fellow, the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health. I know it's a mouthful. And today we are talking about progesterone. What is it good for as it relates to hormone therapy? We have had many podcast episodes on different uh, hormone therapy regimens or thinking through your hormone therapy regimens, but I don't think we've ever specifically done one on progestogens. Um, and that is kind of an umbrella term that we're going to dive in today. I'm kind of breaking down step-by-step. Step. Uh, this is inspired by a, a recent article I read in Menopause by Dr. James Liu called The Role of Progestogens in Hormone Therapy. So what exactly is progesterone? Progesterone is awfully thought of as the other hormone, um, estrogen's quieter partner, but in reality, it plays a really essential role, not only in menstrual cycle and pregnancy, but also into the menopause transition, perimenopause and menopause, postmenopausal years. So when we talk about progestogens, we're referring to this group uh, that includes natural progesterone and synthetic forms called progestins. And with your oral birth control pill, this is progestins is what is in it, your synthetic hormone. They all share one key ability, and that's to, to transform estrogen-primed endometrium into a secretory state. So what does this do? This protects the uterus from endometrial hyperplasia in cancer when we're given estrogen in a systemic format, in our whole body format, right, in women who have a uterus. So if we have a uterus and we're taking systemic hormonal therapy, systemic estrogen, estradiol, or conjugated equine estrogen, uh, or any variation of systemic estrogen, we need a progesterone or progestin to protect that endometrium because otherwise your body goes, oh, we're building a nest and that uterus is going to build up and we can get these um, hyperplasia, atypical cells, um, cancerous cells. So when we are on adequate endometrial protection with our uh, proper progestin or progestogen, I should say, so we're going to use the umbrella term, proper progestogen dosing, then we our risk of endometrial cancer is baseline. So hear me that on hormone therapy, combined estrogen and a progestogen, you do not have an increased risk of endometrial cancer or uterine cancer. Okay. So there are more than 200 progestogens that exist, but in hormone therapy, we only have a few that are commonly used. That is our micronized progesterone, um, which is what we always hear as our bioidentical progesterone, our natural um, mimicking what our body has always made. Uh, we have medroxy progesterone acetate, which is what was included in the Women's Health Initiative. We have norethindrone acetate and drosperinone. Drosperinone is what is in the progesterone only birth control slend. Not all progesterone is absorbed equally. So how you take your progesterone really matters. Oral forms go through that first pass effect in the liver, which means much of it gets metabolized before it reaches your bloodstream. 
micronized progesterone has great absorption. It's taken at bedtime for that uh, sleepy, drowsy, sedative effect that it has. But whenever we use this vaginally, it gets delivered directly to that endometrium. But we have to be careful with our dosing to make sure that we have adequate endometrial protection. What about creams or vaginal routes? Transdermal creams, so cream, progesterone cream applied to the skin, they don't reach therapeutic levels. So they are not indicated, they're not strong enough to protect the uterus. So a transdermal progesterone cream, no, no, no. This is not going to protect your uterus. So we need to be very careful about this because I have plenty of patients who they may feel a little bit better on their or their progesterone cream, but it's not doing anything to protect your uterine lining. So if you're on a systemic estrogen, this is not going to be adequate vaginal route. So we can deliver micronized progesterone vaginally if patients are having a hard time tolerating progesterone. Some people will have acne or bloating or just some or vivid dreams. And for some people, you know, it has the opposite effect from the drowsy, but for most people tolerate micronized progesterone pretty well. But generally there's people who land in three camps, love it, eh, take it because you tell me I have to. And then there's a handful um, I've seen reported, you know, 15%, 18%, sometimes some people say 30%. I had, haven't seen it be that high that do not tolerate progesterone for whatever reason. So if we're not tolerating oral progesterone, we can take it vaginally, but it has not been studied in enough detail for us to say specifically that it has endometrial safety. So this is one I want to make us be really careful about. Um, the data on safety when combined with systemic estrogen is limited. So if we're going to use it vaginally, we have to do it in similar doses and duration just as the oral regimen. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. And then of course we have um, 11 progesterol IUDs that can provide excellent uh, local endometrial protection. This is something like the Moraine or the Lightletta that has 52 milligrams of uh, of 11 progesterol, and it sometimes uses off label in menopausal care. Um, I use it all the time. I love it. Um, patients still may choose, elect to add in a um, oral uh, micronized progesterone later. How do we choose what progesterone? Gen we're going to use though, right? The right choice depends on the woman's goals and where we are in our phase. A uh, bleeding pattern, are we perimenopausal, cardiovascular health, even bone density risk? So you can't progestogens can be taken cyclically. So we need a progesterone for or progestin for at least 12 to 14 days every month. Um, the goal is to kind of mimic that secretory phase and shed the endometrium for that safety. So if you were going to do a 12 to 14 day dosing, that would look like medroxy progesterone acetate, five to 10 milligrams a day, or micronized progesterone of 200 milligrams, 200, 300 milligrams per day, um, a drosperinone of 0.25 to one milligram per day, and norethindrone acetate of a 0.35 to one milligram per day. And here's a helpful clinical pearl. If vaginal bleeding happens on or before day 10 of your progestogen therapy, it may indicate that you don't have adequate individual protection and you may need a higher dose or you may need continuous dosing. So my preference is always continuous dosing because we are creatures of habit. And if you tell me I have to take a tablet for 12 days out of the month, I'm probably not going to remember when the next time rolls around that I need to start taking it for 12 days, right? It gets confusing. You take it through days one through 12 of each month, maybe an easy way for some people to do it. But for most of my patients, they're, they're busy in life and they're not going to remember and, and they don't want to have the withdrawal bleed. So there's that. Okay, let's talk about micronized progesterone and why it's gaining popularity. Um, over the past decade, we've seen a strong shift in this micronized progesterone or bioidentical progesterone. And it's because it's chemically identical to what your body produces. And studies suggest that it may carry lower breast cancer or cardiovascular risk than uh, some of the synthetic progestins. There are trials that have looked at taking micronized progesterone with estrogen at, and they had better HDL cholesterol profile than those on medroxy progesterone acetate. 
An interesting bonus is when taken at bedtime, it's converted into allopregnolone, a neuroactive steroid that promotes a calm and better sleep. So for many women, bedtime progesterone offers both uterine protection and gentle sedative effects. And so we love it for this reason. Another reason that I love to use a nightly micronized progesterone um, and not a cyclic. Um, So I like to do continuous therapy. I feel like my patients tend to just do better overall. But like I said, if we're not tolerating it, then we can just do it for the 12 days out of the month for endometrial protection, but the dosing has to be appropriate for um, endometrial protection. If we're taking it continuous, we can get away with 100 milligrams at bedtime. Um, We may need to increase that to 200 if we're seeing more breakthrough bleeding. All right, but are there other benefits to progestogens or or progesterone? Um, We have progesterone receptors throughout our body, not just our uterus. So the brain, the breast, the bone, the blood vessels. This means that progesterone can influence mood, cognition, and bone density. And in some studies, medroxyprogesterone and norethindrome acetate have shown added bone protection effects when used with estrogen. And while not all progestogens act the same in the brain, natural progesterone or micronized progesterone and its metabolites are being studied as neuroprotective agents, potentially helping recovery for brain injury. So that's kind of exciting. On the flip side, daily continuous synthetic progestins like medroxyprogesterone acetate have been linked with increased breast mitotic activity and may contribute to higher breast cancer risk compared to cyclic or intermittent regimens. Uh, Remember in the Women's Health Initiative, medroxyprogesterone was the progesterone that was used. Um, I will say that medroxyprogesterone does help control bleeding. And so if we're having an issue with perimenopausal menorrhagia in the short term, it can be very helpful uh, for use. But typically we're not using medroxyprogesterone with our hormone therapy, unless that's the only progesterone that we're going to tolerate. So what are some practical takeaways? If you're on systemic estrogen and you have a uterus, you need a progestogen for protection, whether that is a synthetic progestin or micronized progesterone. Micronized progesterone at 200 milligrams nightly for 12 to 14 days per a month provides excellent individual protection and better sleep. I prefer to use this continuously and generally start patients on 100 milligrams every night for individual protection. And depending on their estrogen dose or their symptoms, I may be increasing that. Uh, Transdermal creams are not effective. So progesterone creams are not effective. They're not going to protect your uterus. Um, So this cannot be the only thing that you're doing for individual protection or for the protection of your uterus. The type and schedule of progesterone should be individualized based on your health profile and your symptom goals. Progesterone is much more than just protection of your uterine lining, though. It's a hormone that influences sleep and mood and brain health and bone health and cardiovascular function, all parts of our well-being that matter deeply during perimenopause and menopause. And this can even be added in. So here's some important caveats where it should be added in, okay? Okay. In somebody who has surgically, prematurely menopausal, uh, or who has a history of endometriosis, these are people that I 100% add back progesterone because uh, that di- that time frame without progesterone, patients feel more moodiness, have more disruption of sleep. Even if we're affecting their hot flashes and night sweats, they tend to do better with some um, added back progesterone. If they've had a um, what most people call a complete hysterectomy, but but um, what I'm referring to is having your uterus and ovaries removed for endometriosis, then they have a history of some residual disease or some remaining endometrial implants throughout their abdomen. And we don't want to stimulate those. We don't want those to potentially become cancerous. So if you've had a, your uterus and ovaries removed, and you're on hormone therapy for your surgical menopause, you want to make sure that you're also on a progesterone because that can create some trouble down the line. So when used thoughtfully, uh, progesterone 
can be an important part of holistic, personalized approach to hormone therapy, helping women to feel themselves again. We gave you some insight into progesterone and how it supports your body. And I hope that you'll share it with a friend who's navigating the life and exploring hormone therapy. At Sky Women's Health, we are careful to make sure that we personalize your specific needs. You can find me on Instagram and YouTube at Dr. Carolyn Warriors. And to learn more about our personalized care, you can find us at skywomenshealth.com. Until next time, be well.